Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Martin Evers. I am president of the Robotics and AI Law Society, RAILS, and associate professor of IT law at the University of Tartu in Estonia. In today's talk, I would like to give you an overview of the European Commission's proposal for an AI Act that was presented this year in April and that has as its cornerstone standardization. So standardization plays a major role according to the European Commission's proposal. And this causes a lot of problems and I will give you a critical assessment um, regarding this legislative um, approach. In my introduction, I will first give you an overview of the already existing regulatory framework at European level and forthcoming legislation. Then I will present you the AI Act in a nutshell. And after that, I will return to standardization that uh, plays here a major role in this AI Act. And after uh, that, I will give a critical assessment of this regulatory approach and finally draw some conclusions. So if we look at the regulatory framework um, that might apply to AI systems at a European level, you find out that many aspects that are problematic when it comes to AI systems are already, or at least partly, regulated and subject to European legislation. Human rights are regulated in the EU Charter and also in the European Convention on Human Rights. Safety issues are addressed, especially by the General Product Safety Directive and also the Machinery Directive. Data protection issues are regulated by the General Data Protection Regulation. Problems when it comes to automated decision-making are regulated by Article 22 of the GDPR and some national laws. Facial recognition systems are not banned in the European Union. However, there are new rules that restrict the export of these systems to non-EU countries repressing human rights. When it comes to platform providers, the e-commerce directive of the year 2000 contains rules that apply. Algorithmic discrimination is something that can be uh, being dealt uh, with <clears throat> by uh, the rules foreseen in the anti-discrimination directive. The problem of algorithmic manipulation is partly addressed also by the unfair commercial practices directive. And when it comes to the liability issues that arise when an AI system is used, we might apply the uh, laws that transpose the product liability directive of 1985. And in the field of EU consumer law, we have two additional recently adopted directives, the digital content directive and the sale of goods directive. Now, all of these um, legal uh, rules, of course, have been adopted without taking the specific characteristics um, of AI systems into consideration. And this is why the European Commission correctly came to the conclusion that we need an AI Act that regulates AI systems. But apart from uh, the Artificial Intelligence Act proposal, there are many other proposals that are also important when it comes to AI systems. The European Commission 
Apart from the AI Act proposal, proposed also a regulation on machinery products, a regulation on general product safety. Last year, the European Commission came up with a proposal for a Digital Services Act and for a Digital Markets Act and also for a Data Governance Act. And then there are some forthcoming proposals we can expect in the near future, the European Commission announced that uh, they will present a proposal for an act regulating liability for AI systems. They will revise the sectoral legislation and also come up with a data act. And apart from that, the European standardization organizations, especially SEN and Senelec, will develop harmonized standards uh, for AI systems. So what are the key features of the Artificial Intelligence Act proposal? First of all, this act is um, a horizontal harmonization instrument. It is cross-sectional that it does not regulate the use of AI systems only in a specific sector, but in all kinds of sectors. And this AI Act, because there are already European uh, directives and regulations that might apply to AI systems, complements the existing EU legislation. Although the AI Act is mainly driven by the idea to protect fundamental rights, the legal basis of this Act is Article 114 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union that has as its goal the internal market. So this AI Act is part of the internal market legislation. The AI Act is based on a risk-based approach, differentiating um, what kind of risks are caused by the AI systems. And what is also another key feature of the AI Act is that it contains lots of delegation of powers. So it gives the European Commission the right to an act, adopt delegated acts in order, for example, uh, to change in the future the definition of what is an AI system, what constitutes a high risk AI system and so on in order to make this regulation future proof. But apart from this delegation of powers to the European Commission, there's also, and that is quite problematic, a delegation of powers to ESOs. ESOs are European standardization organizations. So that is to say, SEN, Senelec, and ETSI. Um, in all of that, the AI Act has quite a broad scope of application because according to the definition of what constitutes actually an AI system, the Annex 1 refers not only to machine learning approaches, but also to all kinds of other techniques, such as, for example, logic and knowledge-based approaches, including knowledge representation, logic programming, knowledge basis inferences, and deductive engines, symbolic reasoning and expert systems, and also statistical approaches. And with this wide definition, one might uh, wonder whether the title of uh, this regulation, AI Act, is maybe a little bit misleading, because with its reference to knowledge representation, and symbolic reasoning and expert systems, much uh, more is in the scope. So maybe the correct title would have been Software Act and not AI Act. Also, the personal scope of the AI Act is quite broad. The regulation would be applicable to providers, public and private um, providers placing AI systems on the EU market. What is excluded from the scope is AI developed 
or used exclusively for military purposes. Users um, are, um, uh, are addressed also by the regulation, public or private users. Only non-professional users are excluded from the scope. And even if a user or a provider is in a third country, the regulation is applicable where the output produced by the system is used in the European Union. So the scope of application is quite broad. Then the AI Act follows a risk-based approach. That means there is no one size fits all approach, but the um, density of regulation and uh, depends on the risk of uh, the respective AI systems. AI systems um, um, that um, bear unacceptable risks are prohibited by the AI Act so-called high-risk AI systems are permitted. However, they are subject to mandatory requirements and an ex-ante conformity assessment. AI systems with so-called limited risks are permitted but subject to transparency obligations. And last but not least, those AI systems that have only a minimal or no risk are permitted with no restrictions, but um, in that regard, the AI Act only foresees voluntary codes of conduct. Now, the cornerstone actually of the AI Act are high risk AI uh, systems. So, in the following, I will especially talk here about high risk AI systems, how they are regulated, especially with regard to standardization. So, what constitutes an um, high-risk AI system? Well, there are, by and large, two types of high-risk AI systems. One type is regulated in Annex 2, and the other type is regulated in Annex 3. Annex 2 concerns AI systems that are safety components of products that are already regulated by EU legislation such as, for example, toys, machinery, elevators, and medical devices. All of these products are already subject to the new legislative framework, and they are subject to a third-party assessment under the relevant sectorial legislation. And in case uh, an uh, AI system forms um, um, a component of such a regulated uh, product. Of course, the sectorial legislation continues to apply, but additionally, the AI Act also applies. Now, in contrast, Annex 3 regulates so called standalone AI systems, so systems that are not subject to specific legislation so far. And for these, also the AI Act foresees mandatory requirements. Um, and these standalone AI systems are especially systems in the following areas, biometric identification, categorization of natural persons, um, critical infrastructure, education, employment, access to and enjoyment of essential private and public services, law enforcement, migration, asylum, and border control management, administration of justice, and democratic processes. So what does it mean? Um, if, an, uh, if an AI system is qualified as high risk, then there are mandatory requirements. Uh, for these systems, then it is mandatory to use high quality training, validation, and testing data. It is necessary to establish documentation and design logging features. It is necessary to ensure an appropriate degree of transparency and to provide users with information 
it is necessary to ensure human oversight and also to ensure robustness, accuracy, and cybersecurity of these high risk AI systems. Regarding the enforcement, the AI regulation basically trusts um, uh, before the system is put on, uh, placed on the market, uh, the providers themselves. So there is um, an ex ante conformity assessment that has to be carried out by the provider before the AI system is placed on the market. And uh, here uh, we have already such an assessment foreseen for safety components by the sectoral legislation. However, in case it is a standalone AI system, then there is an internal, largely internal self-assessment by providers themselves. After uh, the AI system is already put into circulation, the member states have uh, to make uh, sure that the requirements for high-risk AI systems are met. And uh, to this end, providers and users have to report serious incidents. And also the regulation gives the authorities the right to access information, documentation, and data, including even the source code of the AI system and foresees that non-compliance can lead to fines up to 30 million euros or 6% of the turnover. And in order to coordinate the activities of member states, uh, the AI regulation also foresees a new board, the European AI board. Now, standardization forms the cornerstone of the AI Act. The AI Act follows the new legislative framework in that it specifies only the essential requirements, whereas the specific requirements regarding data quality, for example, or transparency and so on, um, have to be developed by the European Standardization Organization. And um, uh, then the ex ante conformity assessment for standalone high-risk AI systems should be carried out basically only by the providers under their own responsibility. There is no assessment by third parties. The only exception that is foreseen is um, that in the case of some biometric identification systems. But all other standalone AI systems are only subject to an internal ex ante conformity assessment carried out by the provider. And in case the provider follows a harmonized standard, then there's a presumption of conformity. The AI Act then foresees that it is presumed that uh, the provider um, uh, is uh, um, in conformity with the mandatory requirements. Now, of course, uh, there are lots of um, advantages when it comes uh, to standards, and these advantages can also be recognized here when it comes to standardizing AI. First of all, industry has superior technical expertise. Second, standards um, also um, pave the way for rapid transfer of AI technology. They ensure interoperability. They give providers access to the European market. And standardization organizations also have high hopes that by the means of standards, also legal requirements and ethical values can be embedded in these uh, standards. So that uh, there is the possibility to develop, for example, by the means of standards, the risk-based criticality test for AI systems, and also to establish quality criteria and test procedures for AI systems. 
there are already um, existing standards uh, for AI systems and uh, ongoing activities at uh, European level, international level, and also national uh, level. I would like to point out especially um, the uh, work that is carried out uh, jointly by ISO and IEC. Uh, they are working uh, together um, on things like AI terminology, AI systems, AI robustness, trustworthiness, governance, ethics, machine learning, and many other issues. A recent uh, report published in 2021 by Nativi and De Nigris made um, the uh, effort to see um, uh, how uh, the requirements foreseen for high-risk AI systems regarding data and data governance, documentation, transparency, and so on, are already regulated by standards. And here in bold, you can see the standards already published or in a final draft status, and that correspond to these requirements. However, this study comes to the conclusion that there are still significant gaps at the level of certain AI requirements. And also the German standardization organization, uh, DIN, came to the conclusion that especially or the operationalization of ethical values is still in its infancy. Nevertheless, the European Commission, in its impact assessment, um, uh, said that a large of relevant harmonized standards could be available within three to four years from now, that would coincide with the timing needed for the legislative adoption of the proposal and the traditional um, period envisaged before the legislation becomes applicable to operators. However, and now I come to my critical assessment. First of all, um, there are practical, practical difficulties when it comes to standardized AI systems, because AI systems have some special features First of all, it is difficult to standardize AI systems because of the rapid change, because um, different industries and sectors use AI systems differently, because especially learning systems require a constant assessment, because the quality of AI systems depends heavily on input uh, data. And um, very important AI systems are socio-technical systems. So therefore, it's not enough just to look at uh, the algorithmic system itself, but the entire process um, has uh, to be taken into account. And then there are many ethical and legal questions that are still unsolved. So how can ethical values, legal requirements be transformed, translated into standards and at the end of the day, one might also wonder whether there is enough ethical and legal expertise of the European standardization organization. Apart uh, from these practical uh, difficulties, um, the um, standardization leads also to delegated uh, rulemaking. Of course, formally, Harmonized standards are voluntary rules that are drafted by private bodies such as SEN and Senelec. However, harmonized standards have binding legal effects. First of all, once a harmonized standard has been published, national standards bodies must withdraw all conflicting standards. Second, member states must accept once the provider follows a harmonized standards, this presumption of conformity. And member states can um, also not adopt contradicting laws. And even the market participants, other market participants, are also bound by the harmonized standards because non-compliance of harmonized uh, standards might trigger liability. So all of this uh, leads to the conclusion then that 
although harmonize standards are formally voluntary rules, they are basically uh, rules, binding rules, because they have legal effect. And therefore, to entrust the development of harmonized standards, um, uh, the uh, European Standardization Organization, in the end, leads to a delegation of rulemaking. And this is problematic because uh, there is a lack of democratic control when it comes to standardization. Standards are developed exclusively by the standardization organizations. The European Parliament and member states have no veto rights. The European Commission decides only whether and how to make a standardization request and can also refuse to publish the standard in the official journal. But at the end of the day, the European Commission has neither the expertise nor actually the power to control the content of the standard. Then there is a lack of democratic participation of um, uh, stakeholders because in CEN and CENELEC, only national standards bodies have full rights, but um, NGOs, stakeholders have only very limited rights. They have no voting rights. They have only limited rights to lodge an appeal against decisions. And there's lots of de facto obstacles because many NGOs don't have experience in standardization. They are not represented even at European level. And also active participation is costly and time consuming. Even after a standard has been developed, there is a lack of judicial control. Although the Court of Justice of the European Union in James Elliott recognized that it has the competence to interpret harmonized standards, so far there are no indications uh, that the validity of harmonized standards can be controlled by the Court of Justice of the European Union. At the end of the day, Standards are not acts of European institutions. Only the decision of the European Commission to publish a standard in the official journal could be subject to such a review. However, when the European Commission decides to publish a standard, the Commission does not control the content of the standard. My conclusion is therefore that standards are largely immune from judicial review. So now I come to my overall assessment of the AI proposal. It is a proposal that is very innovative and well-designed, especially the risk-based approach is convincing. However, the broad AI definition creates the risk of over-regulation. But on the other hand, the self-enforcement structure um, creates the risk of under-regulation, especially here, the rulemaking powers of private European standardization organizations are problematic because of the lack of democratic control, because of the lack of democratic participation, and because the lack of judicial um, control. So my recommendations therefore are that the AI Act itself should regulate the fundamental issues and not entrust the European standardization organizations with this uh, task. Details can still be regulated by standardization organizations, but the essential thing, when uh, is uh, the data um, uh, quality enough? Uh, how about the transparency issues? How about uh, bias and so on? This has to be regulated by the act itself. But in, at the end of the day, what is also necessary is to improve the decision-making process within CEN and CENELEC by giving stakeholders, for example, voting rights, by giving stakeholders the possibility um, to appeal against decisions, and uh, by giving them access to technical bodies and standards free of charge. So these are um, my critical uh, conclusions. I look forward to your comments and to the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention.